Thank you so much for joining us again. We're going to read chapter two of the Azusa Street Revival uh, by Frank Bartleman. I hope you listen to that first chapter. It's just unbelievable, the faith in this man. And we're believing that this is what's going to happen in us. I pray that this get deep inside of your spirit and that you get a burden to intercede and pray and believe for revival. We're calling for Indianapolis, Indiana to be saved in Jesus' name. So chapter two. Pastor Small returns from Wales. June 17th, I went to Los Angeles to attend a meeting at the First Baptist Church. They were waiting on God for an outpouring of the Spirit there. Their pastor, Joseph Small, had just returned from Wales. He had been in touch with the Revival and Evan Roberts and was on fire to have the same visitation and blessing come to his own church in Los Angeles. I found this meeting of an exact peace with my own vision, burden, and desire and spent two hours in the church in prayer before the evening service began. Meetings were being held every day and night there and God was present. One afternoon I started the meeting in Los Angeles while they were waiting for Small to appear. I exhorted them not to wait for man but to expect from God. They were depending on some great one, the same spirit of idolatry that has cursed the church and hindered God in all ages. Like the children of Israel, the people must have some other God before him. In state church circles in Europe, the pastor is often known as the little God. I started the service in the evening on the church steps outside while we were waiting for the janitor to arrive with the key. We had a season of prayer for the surrounding community. The evening, meetings, the evening meeting was a steady sweep of victory. When God's church becomes what it should be in love and unity, the doors will never be closed or locked. Like the temple of old, it will be always open. We saw this later at Azusa Mission. God has not got 666 churches of all different names there is no division in a true Pentecost, neither in true worship. God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. John 4, 24. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body and were made to drink of one spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Ancient Israel, when right with God, were one. How much more should the church be? We have priests enough to serve continually and plenty of seeking needy people to fill the church at all times. How far have we fallen from the early pattern and even from the type of the church, Israel? We are so short we scarcely recognize the real thing. Even the Roman church, though formal, is ahead of us in this. The difficulty and shame is that we are hopelessly divided. I went to Lamanda Park again and after preaching, spent the night at the parsonage, praying and sleeping alternately. I wanted a fuller revelation of Jesus to my own soul, like the full moon that draws clearer and nearer to our vision as we continue to steadfastly gaze at it, so Jesus appears more real to our souls as we continue to contemplate Him. We need a closer, personal, vital relationship, acquaintance, and communion with God. Only the man who lives in fellowship with divine reality can be used to call the people to God. I went to Small's church again and again found, the listlessly, found them listlessly waiting for the preacher to appear. Many did not seem to have any definite idea what they had come to meeting for. I began to pray aloud and the meeting started off with power. It was in full blast when Brother Small arrived. God wanted the people to look to Him and not to man. Those not having the glory of God first in view would naturally resent this, but it is God's plan. We now moved into a little cottage at 175 and a half North Vernon Avenue, Pasadena, paying $3 per month rent for one room and a small kitchen, unfurnished, without gas or water. I found most Christians did not want to take on a burden of prayer. It was too hard on the flesh. I was carrying this burden now in an ever-increasing volume night and day. The ministry was intense. It was the fellowship of the sufferings, of travail of soul, with groanings that could not be uttered, Romans 8, 26 and 27. Most believers find it easier to criticize than to pray. 
One day I was much burdened in prayer. I went to Brother Manley's tent and fell at the altar, there unburdening my soul. A worker ran in front, ran in from a side tent and begged me to pray for him. I attended another meeting that night and there found a young brother, Edward Bomer, who had been dug out in the uh, pineal meetings in the spring with the same burden of prayer on him. We were wonderfully united in the Spirit from that time on. He was destined to become my prayer helper in the future. We prayed together at the little pineal mission until 2 a.m. God wonderfully met and assured us as we wrestled with Him for the outpouring of His Holy Spirit upon the people. My life was by this time literally swallowed up in prayer. I was praying day and night. I wrote more articles for the religious press exhorting the saints to prayer and went to Smalls again in Los Angeles. Here I found the people waiting for the preacher again. I was greatly burdened for the situation and tried to show them they must expect from God. Some resented this, being bound by age-old custom, but others responded to it. They were praying for a revival like they had in Wales. This was one of the outstanding features there. In Wales, they expected from God. The meetings went on whether the preacher was present or absent. They came to meet God, and He met them. I had written a letter to Evan Roberts in Wales asking them to pray for us in California. I now received a reply that they were doing so, which linked us up with the revival there. The letter read as follows. My dear brother in the faith, many thanks for your kind letter. I am impressed of your sincerity and honesty of purpose. <clears throat> Congregate the people together who are willing to make a total surrender. Pray and wait. Believe God's promises. Hold daily meetings. May God bless you is my earnest prayer. Yours in Christ, Evan Roberts. We were much encouraged to know that they were praying for us in Wales. I preached at Lamonda Park again and one night got so blessed while preaching about Elijah's sacrifice that I leaped for joy. I was informed after the service that some of the people were very much shocked at my undignified action and that they did not want me anymore and they were Methodists at that. God had blessed my ministry much in that place. The devil did not want me to preach anymore there. Church fairs and suppers were all right, and in fact, all the rage with them at this time. That was dignified. But I was encouraged when I remembered the fact that neither Wesley nor Fletcher were often allowed to speak the second time in the churches of their day. Many looked upon Fletcher as a monster, when in fact he was one of the most saintly men of his time. Few people really knew, really know God in any time. I went frequently to Brother Small's church in Los Angeles, taking part in the meetings with much blessing. The Pineal boys went with me and helped to fan the flame. We were much tested at home along financial lines. Money was very tight, but God did not allow us to really suffer. I wrote some articles for The Way of Faith, The Christian Harvester, and for God's Revivalist at this time. The following are extracts. Quote, a wonderful work of the Spirit is broken out here in Los Angeles, California, preceded by a deep preparatory work of prayer and expectation. Conviction is rapidly spreading among the people, and they are rallying from all over the city to the meetings at Pastor Small's church. Already these meetings are beginning to run themselves. Souls are being saved all over the house, while the meeting sweeps on unguided by human hands. The tide is rising rapidly. And we are, stuck page, and we are anticipating wonderful things. Soul travail is becoming an important feature of the work, and we are being swept away beyond sectarian barriers. The fear of God is coming upon the people, a very spirit of burning. Sunday night, the meeting ran on until the small hours of the next morning. Pastor Small is prophesying of wonderful things to come. He prophesies the speedy return of the apostolic gifts to the church. Los Angeles is a veritable Jerusalem, just the place for a mighty work of God to begin. I've been expecting just such a display of divine power for some time, have felt, in might, have felt it might break out at any hour. Also, that it was liable to come where least expected, that God might get the glory. For a, pray for a Pentecost. 
F. Bartleman, June 1905. One evening, July 3rd, I felt strongly impressed to go to the little uh, Pineal Hall in Pasadena to pray. There I found Brother Bomer ahead of me. He had also been led of God to the hall. We prayed for a spirit of revival for Pasadena until the burden became well nigh unbearable. I, crowd, I cried out like a woman in birth pangs. The spirit was interceding through us. Finally, the burden left us. After a little time of quiet waiting, a great calm settled down upon us. Then, then suddenly, without premonition, the Lord Jesus himself revealed himself to us. He seemed to stand directly between us, so close we could have reached out our hand and touched him. But we did not dare to move. I could not even look. In fact, I, I seemed all spirit. His presence seemed more real, if possible, than if I could have seen and touched him naturally. I forgot I had eyes or ears. My spirit recognized him. A heaven of divine love, of divine love filled and thrilled my soul. Burning fire went through me. In fact, my whole being seemed to flow down before him like wax before the fire. I lost all consciousness of time or space, being conscious only of His wonderful presence. I worshipped at His feet. It seemed a veritable mount of transfiguration. I was lost in pure spirit. For some time He remained with us, then slowly He withdrew His presence. He would have been there yet had He not withdrawn. I'm sorry, we would have been there yet had He not withdrawn. I could not doubt his reality after that experience. Brother Bomer experienced largely the same thing. We had lost all consciousness of each other's presence while he remained with us. We were almost afraid to speak or breathe when we came back to our surroundings. The Lord had said nothing to us, but only ravished our spirits by his presence. He had come to strengthen and assure us for his service. We knew now we were workers with him, fellowshippers of his sufferings in the ministry of soul travail. Real soul travail is just as definite in the spirit as natural human birth pangs. The simile is almost perfect in its sameness. No soul is ever born without this. All true revival of salvation comes this way. The sun was up next morning before we left the hall but the night had seemed but half an hour. The presence of God eliminates all sense of time. With Him all is eternity. It is eternal life. God knows no time. This element is lost in heaven. This is the secret of time appearing to, to pass so swiftly in all nights of real prayer. Time is suspended. The element of eternity is there. For days that marvelous presence seemed to walk by my side. The Lord Jesus was so real. I could scarcely take up with human conversation again. It seemed so crude and empty. Human spirits seemed so harsh. Earthly fellowship a torment. How far we are naturally from the gentle spirit of Christ. I spent the following day in prayer going to Small's Church in the evening where I had a ministry and intercession. Heavenly peace and joy filled my soul. Jesus was so real. Doubts and fears cannot abide in His presence. Someone left a load of wood at our door one day in our absence. We never knew who brought it. We had been praying for wood. I attended Brother Small's meeting in Los Angeles often and had a blessed ministry and intercession there. God wonderfully poured out His Spirit. Our rent was due again, but a brother wrote a check for the amount, all unsolicited. We had been praying for it. I wrote a number of articles to several holiness papers describing God's operations among us and exhorting the saints everywhere to, to faith and prayer for revival. The Lord used these articles greatly to bring faith and conviction in many places. I was soon receiving quite a large correspondence from many places. My concern was chiefly for the holiness people, that they might not be passed by and lose this blessing. I wrote in my diary at this time the following observations. A warning to the Pentecostal people, quote, The holiness people are loaded down to the water's edge with a spirit of prejudice and Phariseeism. But dare we cut ourselves off so easily from other members of the body? We may cut ourselves off from God by our spiritual pride, while He may cause the weakest 
to repent and go through to victory, referring to the work in the First Baptist Church at Brother Smalls. The work in our own hearts must go deeper than we have ever experienced, deep enough to destroy sectarian prejudice, party, spirit, etc. on all sides. The work of revival seems to have started outside of holiness churches proper. God can perfect those whom He chooses. The holiness people are too proud of their standing, too confident of their position and condition also. He may need to pass them by. They must also repent. God may humble them by working in other places. And history repeats itself. Let the Pentecostal people beware. The present worldwide revival was rocked in the cradle of little wells. It was brought up in India following, becoming full grown in Los Angeles later. I received from God early in 1905 the following keynote to revival, quote, The depth of revival will be determined exactly by the depth of the spirit of repentance, end quote. And this will obtain for all people at all, at all times. The revival spirit at Brother Smalls rapidly spread its interest over the entire city among the spiritual people. Workers were coming in from all parts from various affiliations, uniting their prayers with us for a general outpouring. The circle of interest widened rapidly. We were now praying for California, for the nation, and also for a worldwide revival. The spirit of prophecy began to work among us for mighty things on a large scale. Someone sent me 5,000 pamphlets on the revival in Wales. These I distributed among the churches. They had a wonderful quickening influence. I visited Small's church again and started the meeting. He had not yet arrived. The meetings were getting wonderful by this time for their spontaneity. Our little Gideon's band was marching on to certain victory, led by the captain of their salvation, Jesus. I was led to pray at this early date, especially for faith, discernment of spirits, healing, prophecy. I felt I needed more wisdom and love also. I seemed to receive the real gift of faith for the revival at this time with a spirit of prophecy to the same end and began to prophesy of mighty things to come. When we began to pray in the spring of 1905, no one seemed to have, have much faith for anything out of the ordinary. Pessimism in regard to the present condition seemed to obtain generally among the saints, but this condition had changed. God Himself had given us faith for better things. There had been nothing in sight to stimulate to this. It came from nothing, and cannot He do the same today? I wrote an article at this time for the Daily News of Pasadena describing what I saw in Brother Small's church. It was published and the manager himself came to see soon after. He was greatly convicted, came to the altar and sought, sought God earnestly. The article was copied in a number of holiness papers throughout the country. It was entitled, What I Saw in a Los Angeles Church. The following are some extracts. Quote, for some weeks, special services have been held in the First Baptist Church, Los Angeles. Pastor Small has returned from Wells, where he was in touch with Evan Roberts and the revival. He registers his, his conviction that Los Angeles will soon be shaken by the mighty power of God. The service of which I am writing began impromptu and spontaneous sometime before the pastor arrived. A handful of people had gathered early, which seemed to be sufficient for the Spirit's operation. The meeting started. Their expectation was from God. God was there. The people were there. And by that time the pastor arrived, the meeting was in full swing. Pastor Small dropped into his place, but no one seemed to pay any special attention to him. Their minds were on God. No one seemed to get in another's way. Although the congregation represented many religious bodies, all seemed in perfect harmony. The Spirit was leading. The pastor arose, read a portion of scripture, made a few well-chosen remarks full of hope and inspiration for the occasion, and the meeting passed again from his hands. The people took it up and went on as before. Testimony, prayer, and praise were intermingled throughout the service. The meeting seemed to run itself as far as human guidance was concerned. The pastor was one of them. If once is at all impossible, I'm sorry, if one is at all impossible, impressionable religiously, they must feel in such an atmosphere that something wonderful and imminent is about to take place. 
Some mysterious mighty upheaval in the spiritual world is evidently at our doors. The meeting gives one a feeling of heaven on earth with an assurance that the supernatural exists and that in a very real sense. F. Bartleman, The Daily News, Pasadena. I wrote another article for the Wesleyan Methodist at the same time, of which the following are extracts. Quote, Mercy rejected means judgment, and on a corresponding scale. In all the history of God's world, there has always been first the offer of divine mercy, then judgment following. First comes Christ on the white horse of mercy, then follows the red, black, and pale horses of war, famine, and death. The prophets ceased not day and night to faithfully warn Israel, but their tears and entreaties, for the most part, proved in vain. The awful destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70, which resulted in the extermination of a million Jews and the captivity of multitudes more, was preceded by the offer of divine mercy at the hands of the Son of God Himself. End quote. In 1859, a great revival wave visited our country, sweeping a half million souls into the fountain of salvation. Immediately, the terrible carnage of 1861 to 1865 followed. And so, as we anticipate the coming revival, which is already assuming rapidly worldwide proportions, we wonder, will not judgment follow mercy, as at other times, and judgment in proportion to the mercy extended? The present warlike attitude and distress of the nations makes us wonder if the judgment to follow may not even plunge us into the tribulation of the Great One. F. Bartleman, July 1905. For God's revivalists, I wrote, quote, Unbelief of every form has come in upon us like a flood, but lo, our God comes also. A standard is being raised against the enemy. The Lord is choosing out His workers. This is a time to realize the vision for service. The Lord hath spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun into the going down thereof. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. Gather my saints together unto me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Psalms 50. End quote. I used often to declare during 1905 that I would rather live six months at that time than 50 years of ordinary time. It was a day of the beginning of great things. For the grain of corn that was willing to fall into the ground and die, there was promise of abundant harvest. But for spiritual flappers... The whole matter was naturally foolishness. I wrote another letter, letter to Evan Roberts asking for continued prayer for California. Thus we were kept linked up in prayer with Wells for the revival. In those days, real prayer was little understood. It was hard to find a quiet place where one would not be disturbed. Gethsemane experiences with Jesus were rare among the saints in those days. And it is fast getting to be the same condition among our Pentecostal missions. In the Azusa mission days, the first thought for a suitable mission was the prayer room. Now it seems too often to be the last consideration. At Small's Church one day, I was groaning in prayer at the altar. The spirit of intercession was upon me. A brother rebuked me severely. He did not understand it. The flesh naturally shrinks from such ordeals. The groans are no more popular in most churches than is a woman in birth pangs in the home. So travail does not make pleasant company for selfish worldlings, but we cannot have souls born without it. Childbearing is anything but a popular exercise these days, and so with a real revival of newborn so and so with a real revival of newborn souls in the church. Modern society has little place for a childbearing mother. They prefer society flappers, and so with the churches regarding soul travail. There is little burden for souls. Men run from the groans of a woman in travail of birth, and so the church desires no groans today. She's too busy enjoying herself. We were much pressed financially again, but the Lord delivered. We never made our own wants known to anyone but God and never begged or borrowed, no matter how pressing the need might be. We believed if the saints were living close enough to God, He would speak to them. We trusted Him fully and went without if He did not send help. I wrote my first tract at this time. It was entitled, Love Never Faileth. This was the beginning of a large faith tract ministry. 
I had to trust the Lord for the means, but He never failed me. I was preaching at, a various, at various meetings during those days and had a message on me one day before Brother Manley's meeting. I wanted a quotation of two lines from a volume of Clark's commentaries. There were four volumes, each contained 1,000 pages. I only had a few minutes to find it. Prayerfully, I chose one of the volumes, closed my eyes, and let the book drop open of itself. It was not marked or pressed at that particular page, but wonderful to relate. The book opened exactly at the right place, and my eyes fell directly on the quotation that I wanted. This would have been impossible in the natural had I not at all known where in the book to find it. I only remembered having read it. This strengthened my faith greatly for the message, but I certainly would not, of course, advise this as a practice. At Brother Small's church one evening, the meeting ran away in the flesh. He called the people to prayer, and the crowd thinned down to one-fourth. Then God came in power. There was too much religion there. I ordered a tract printed, Come Angel Band, and asked the Lord to give me one thousand for a certain price. The printer charged me exactly that amount knowing nothing of my course of prayer. A sister handed me five dollars. She said the Lord had been talking to her for some time about giving me this. It was the exact amount I had been praying for. I prayed for another five dollars I needed, and a brother soon handed me the exact amount also without a hint from me on the subject. I trembled to think how wonderfully the Lord was caring for us. My life was wholly at His service, but I dared not be presumptuous. One evening I went to Brother Manley's tent meeting without a thought of taking part in the service. I sat in the rear. Soon the Spirit came mightily upon me. I rose and spoke and the power of God fell upon the congregation. The whole company fell on their faces. For three hours the whole tent was an altar service and prayer continued. A number were saved and everybody seemed to get help from God. It was a wonderful visitation of the Spirit. The people were not as rebellious in those days as they are now. They were more willing to have the program broken into, and, and, and there were not so many fanatical spirits to hinder. There was a real hunger for God. Almost every night found me taking part in some meeting. The Lord continued to pour out His Spirit. About this time, I had an awful attack of neuralgia of the stomach. I felt I would die. I fasted and prayed a whole day and night, and the Lord delivered. It seemed the devil wanted to kill me. I wrote another tract entitled, That They May All Become One. This stirred the sectarian devil fiercely, but it was Jesus' own prayer, John 17, that the world may believe. A friend paid our expenses at the holiness camp meeting in the Arroyo for a few days as we tented there. It was midsummer. We enjoyed the change and outing. I spent most of my time on my face in the woods in prayer. In the moonlight evenings, I poured out my soul into God and He met me there. There was much empty wagon rattle in the camp. Most were seeking selfish blessings. They rushed to meetings like a big sponge to get more blessings. They needed stepping on and, and so with the Pentecostal people today largely. Our cottage rent was due again, and the devil fought hard, but God came to our help. Little Ruth was taken very sick at the camp. The weather was hot. We prayed all one night for her, and the Lord touched her. I found my soul crying out for God far beyond the seeming aspirations of the most of the holiness people. I wanted to go deeper, beneath the mere emotional realm to something more substantial and lasting that would put a rock in my soul. I was tired of so much uh, ev evanescent froth and foam, so much religious ranting and bombast. And the Lord did not long disappoint me. The camp meeting committee now got, on, got me on the carpet because of the tracts I was distributing in the camp. They thought I was attacking the holiness movement, but I was only exhorting them to a deeper place in God. They needed more humility and love. My tract against sectarianism that they all may be one, stirred the camp. Surely man-made movements need to be stirred, but God, but God has but one movement, one body. This was the message at Azusa Mission in the beginning. I received a second letter from Evan Roberts, which read as follows. Wells, 7-8-1905. Dear brother, 
I am very thankful to you for your thoughtful kindness. I was exceedingly pleased to learn the good news of how you are beginning to experience wonderful things. Praying God to continue to bless you, and with many thanks repeated for your good wishes, I am yours in the service, Evan Roberts. One evening at the Holiness Camp, the Lord told me He wanted me to preach. I went out in the woods and tried to pray for the meeting, but He said, I want you to preach. I told Him they would not let me. They had a dozen of their own itching for the opportunity. Besides, they were half afraid of me. I did not belong to their particular branch of religion. But He said, Preach. I told Him if He would close every other mouth that night, I would obey Him. Throwing the responsi responsibility thus on Him, I went to the meeting. It was time for the message. They looked at one another, but every tongue was tied. No one looked at me. The Spirit came upon me, and I sprang to my feet. God flooded my soul with power. The message came straight from Him and went like an arrow to the mark. It shook the camp. Little Ruth was now taken with convulsions, and the devil tried to kill her. It was very hot, and she was teething. This was the devil's pay for me. We moved back to our cottage in Pasadena again. I mailed 18 separate packages of my tracts to as many missions on the Pacific coast. Then God gave me another tract, the heart of the matter. In this, I sought to set forth the real object of our worship and faith, Jesus Christ, central preaching, without any windows. Little Ruth grew worse until we had but small hope in the natural for her life. But God heard our cries and spared her. The enemy seemed determined to rob us of our last remaining child. Financially, we were in hard straits also. Not a penny was coming in, but help came just in the nick of time. God did not fail us. We were trusting Him. One night, the, the devil came very close to me. I awoke suddenly out of my sleep to find his presence almost as real as my own in the room. I cried to God for help, and he fled. Wife felt his presence also just before I awoke. We were going through a furnace of fire, but the fourth, was with us, the fourth man in the fire. Human help seemed to fail us utterly. The enemy seemed determined to give me, to drive me from the work. I was spending whole nights and days in prayer. Evidently, Satan's kingdom was suffering. The neighbors hearing me groan in prayer thought I must be sick and inquired of my condition, but it was only soul burden. The Lord had undertaken wonderful, wonderfully for me on my last tract. The printer miscalculated and took the job for $6.50. It was worth $9. He stood by his bargain. Then he spoiled $1,000 by a slight misprint. These he gave me for almost nothing. I corrected the mistake with my pen. At Pineal Mission, Los Angeles, a sister spoke to me after the meeting one day and then passed on. I felt the Lord wanted her to give me some money. I was much in need, so I silently prayed. She stopped about ten feet from me, came back, and handed me one dollar. I was telling a brother of the incident a few minutes later when he told me to wait a minute for him. He went to his room in the mission and returned at once with two dollars for me. God had heard my prayer. I went to Small's church that night, and he resigned. The meetings had run daily in the First Baptist Church for 15 weeks. It was now September. The officials of the church were tired of the innovations and wanted to return to the old order. He was told to either stop the revival or get out. He wisely chose the latter. But what an awful position for a church to take, to throw God out. In this same way, they, they later drove the Spirit of God out of the churches in Wales. They, they tired of his presence, desiring to return to the old, cold, ecclesiastical order. How blind men are! The most spiritual of pastors, Small's members, naturally followed him with a nucleus of other workers who had gathered to him from other sources during the revival. They immediately contemplated organizing a New Testament church. I had a feeling perhaps the Lord was cutting Brother Small loose for the evangelistic field, at least for a time, to spread the fire in other places. But he did not see it so. I had a conference with him about this object in view and was able to arrange for him to speak at the Lake Avenue Church for Pastor Brink in Pasadena. This had been the storm center of the revival there. I walked all day spreading the news of the meeting, not having money for car fare, and was so tired at night I could not sleep. We had not a penny. Our rent was due, and yet I was silently pouring out my life in the service of God. We had barely the necessities for living. Surely someone must have been failing God. 
the Lord was wonderfully with me in the Spirit. Many were being blessed by my ministry. The leaders did not encourage me very much, but the humble, hungry souls heard of Jesus gladly. A revival almost always begins among the laity. The ecclesiastical uh, leaders seldom welcome reformation. History repeats itself. The present leaders are too comfortably situated as a rule to desire innovation that might require sacrifice on their part. And God's fire only falls on sacrifice. An empty altar receives no fire. Cold intellectualism, formal ecclesiasticism, and priestly dom domination are altogether outside the genius of the gospel. Thank God there are exceptions among the leaders. But we are saved to serve. The true minister is a servant. Jesus came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. Even the mighty evangelist um, Charles G. Finney was so poor after 15 years uh, prodigious labors for the Lord that he was obliged to sell his traveling trunk to buy a cow for the support of his family. The night before Brother Small's services at Lake Avenue Church, two of us spent the night until after midnight in prayer. Brother Small preached twice on Sunday. He was wonderfully anointed of God for the occasion. We spent the time between the services in prayer. His message was on the revival in Wells. The people were greatly moved. Brother Small soon organized a New Testament church. I became a charter member, and as I felt I ought to stay with them, though I did not care very much for the organization. We got to the point where we had to have money for rent and food and, or be turned out to starve. While sitting at my table writing, the Lord spoke and told me to go and see Brother George Crary. The impression was so strong, I dropped my pen and went at once. After a season of prayer with Brother Crary and his wife, I started to go. I had not said a word about our needs. They handed me $2.50 with the remark that the Lord had sent me there for them to give me this. The devil had tried to run Brother Crary off three times before I got there, but God held him. A little later, another brother gave me a dollar. The Lord showed him to do this. So I had three dollars for my rent and 50 cents to buy food with. We could buy much more for 50 cents in those days than we can now. One morning soon after this, while we were on our knees praying at home and in much need of food, the grocery man drove up and left five dollars worth of groceries. He would not tell us who sent it. Someone had paid for it for us. Little Ruth ate a green peach and came near dying again. Prayer saved her. Brother Small now re rented Burbank Hall and prepared to hold meetings there. I secured the 4th Street Holiness Hall for him until Burbank Hall was ready. The Lord gave me another tract entitled, Pray, Pray, Pray. It I took it to the printer in faith and he sent me the money on time. It was a strong exhortation to prayer. Like the prophets of old, we must pray for those who will not pray for themselves. We must confess the sins of the people for them. At one time, while Brother Bomer and I prayed, the Spirit was poured out in a wonderful way in several meetings we were praying for. We felt we had hold of God for them. Following reports proved our convictions. Prayer changes things. There was wonderful power in the proper kind of prayer. Instance Elijah on Mount Carmel, a man of like passions with us. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much in its working. James 5.16 Confession may also be necessary in this connection. Confess therefore your faults one to another. I now had a cottage offered me in Los Angeles for $8 per month. We had felt for some time the Lord wanted us back in Los Angeles. He sent us the first month's rent and Brother Pinfield in Pasadena loaned me his mule team to move us. We located in the rear of the lot at 619 Town Avenue. The landlady lived in the front house. It was September 27, 1905. I was strongly impressed one whole night in prayer to go to San Diego, so I wrote Sister Tilly Hafner in charge of Pineal Mission there. The money came in for my fare without solicitation. It was God's will. I preached in Pineal Mission in San Diego and held street meetings. The police hindered me much, standing in with the saloons, etc. But God gave strength and victory. I visited and prayed with a number of sick people there also and took a little run over to old Tijuana, Mexico. 
The burning bush had spoiled the spirit of the saints greatly in San Diego. It had made them harsh and hard. There was little love but much strife and contention. God made me a messenger of peace as usual. I've always stood for the one body of Christ. Sister Hafner expressed herself as being much encouraged by my visit. She had had a very hard fight of it. I was taken very sick before I left there and lay awake all one night with chills and fever. But I had a remarkable experience in this. I had the grip. Although racked with pain and burning up with fever, a tremendous spirit of prayer was upon me. I seemed like two separate persons. My brain seemed separate and alive for God. I felt all spirit. In my body, I was sick enough to die. My suffering but seemed to press my soul outside of my body. It was a peculiar experience. I'm sure the devil was the loser by it. My spirit seemed completely lifted above my physical condition. I spoke at the Friends Church Sunday morning on the revival in Wales and then returned home to Los Angeles. I was so weak, I was afraid I, was, I would have to be taken from the train on a stretcher. But I got home safely. I had just enough money to get home with. We were up against it financially again. A brother sent me two dollars in a letter stating the Lord had shown him we were in need. We were praying hard. What a blessing thing to be living where God can speak to one even though it may cost us something in obedience. Few seem to be living in this place today. Hence the tremendous suffering among God's workers. I'm convinced that many true workers are hated bitterly simply because those who feel their prayers and to, and to whom God is speaking to help them will not obey the voice of the Lord. Selfishness is a damning sin. Those who give to God cannot possibly lose by it. In fact, the only thing we really save is what we give to God. The rest is all lost eventually. Almost every day in Los Angeles found me engaged in personal work, tract distribution, prayer, or preaching in some meeting. I was writing articles for the religious press continually. I fasted and prayed before going to a tent meeting in Pasadena. The Lord wonderfully anointed me in preaching and 20 souls came to the altar. By this time, the spirit of intercession had so possessed me that I prayed almost day and night. I fasted much also until my wife also almost despaired of my life at times. The sorrows of my Lord had gripped me. I was in the garden with him. The travail of his soul had fallen in a measure on me. It, I was led to fear like him that I might not live to realize the answer to my prayers and tears for the revival. But he assured me, sending more than one angel to strengthen me, I am satisfied. I felt I was realizing a little of what Paul meant by filling up the cup of his sufferings for a lost world. Some were even afraid that I was losing my mind. They could not understand my tremendous concern, nor can very many understand these things today. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit. They are foolishness unto him. Selfish spirits can never understand such sacrifice. But he that would save his life shall lose it, except a grain of corn fall to the ground and die, etc. Our Lord was a man of sorrow, as well as a man of joy. I frequently went to Pasadena having to trust God for car fare to get home. On one occasion, Brother Bomer had an impression I was coming. He went to the little pineal mission and found me there. We spent several hours in prayer. Then he paid my car fare home. We often spent whole nights together in prayer during those days. It seemed a great privilege to spend a whole night with the Lord. He drew so near. We never seemed to get weary on such occasions. Bomer worked at gardening. I, I never asked him for a penny, but he always gave me something. God finally not only got his money, but his life also in his service. He was a wonderful man of prayer. God taught us what it means to know no man after the flesh. He lifted us into such a high relationship that our fellowship seemed only in the spirit. Beyond that, we died to one another. I wrote Evan Roberts a third time to have them continue to pray for us in Wales. In those days after I had preached, I generally called the saints to their knees and we would be for hours in prayer before we could get up. The Lord led me to write many leaders throughout the country to pray for revival. The spirit of prayer was growing continually. The New Testament church seemed to be losing the spirit of prayer as they increased their organization. They now tried to shift this ministry on a few of us. I knew God was not pleased with that and became much burdened for them. They had taken on too many secondary interests. It began to look as though the Lord would have to find another body. 
My hopes had been high for this particular company of people, but the enemy seemed to be sidetracking them now, leading them to miss God's best for them at least. They were now even attempting to organize prayer, a thing impossible. Prayer is spontaneous. I felt it were better not to have organized than to lose the ministry of prayer and spirit of revival as a body. It was for this that they had been called in the beginning. They had become ambitious for a church, an organization, and it seemed hard to them to not be like the other nations or churches around about them. And right here they surely began to fail. As church work increased, the real issue was lost out of sight. And the Pentecostal missions appear to be facing the same danger today. Human organization and human program leave very little room for the free spirit of God. It means much to be willing to be considered a failure while we seek to build up a purely spiritual kingdom. God's kingdom cometh not by observation. It is very easy to choose second best. The prayer life is needed much more than even buildings or organizations. These are often a substitute for the other. Souls are born in the, into the kingdom only through prayer. I feared the New Testament church might develop a party, sectarian spirit. A rich lady offered them the money to build a church edifice with. The devil was bidding high, but, sh but she soon withdrew her offer. I confess I was glad she did. They would soon have had no time for anything but building then. It would have been the end of their revival. We had been called out to evangelize Los Angeles, not to build up another sect or party spirit. We needed no more organization nor machinery than what was, than, than what was really necessary for the speedy evangelizing of the city. Surely we had enough separate revival church organizations already on our hands, each working largely for its own interest, advancement, and glory. We had nothing to eat in the house but a little dry bread on one occasion about this time when I received a letter from Brother Bomer with a dollar in it. He was in close touch with God. Possibly the saints would do better by the true ones if there were not so many frauds to shake their confidence. Every false shepherd and deceiver in the ranks makes it just that much harder for the true ones. The New Testament church seemed to be drifting toward intellectualism. I became much burdened for it. During one meeting, I groaned aloud in prayer. It was killing after the meetings we had had. One of the elders rebuked me severely for this. How are the mighty fallen kept ringing in my ears. A few of the most spiritual had the same burden with me. Prayer again seemed to prevail in a measure. We had a great meeting in the church soon after. One hundred knelt at the altar at a single Sunday night service. I met with the uh, Pineal boys in Pasadena for prayer, and we had a breaking through time. We felt the Lord would soon work mightily. At Brother Brownlee's tent at 7th and Spring Streets, Los Angeles, we had a deep spirit of prayer and powerful altar services. There was a feeling that God was about to do something extraordinary. The spirit of prayer came more and more heavily upon us. In Pasadena, before moving to Los Angeles, I would lie on my bed in the daytime and roll and groan under that burden. At night, I could scarcely sleep for the spirit of prayer. I fasted much, not caring for food while burdened. At one time, I was in soul travail, travail for nearly 24 hours without intermission. It nearly used me up. Prayer literally consumed me. I would groan all night in my sleep. Prayer was not formal in those days. It was God-breathed. It came upon us and it overwhelmed us. We did not work it up. We were gripped with real soul travail by the Spirit that could no more be shaken off than could the birth pangs of a woman in travail without doing absolute violence to the Spirit of God. It was real intercession by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to stop there at this time and we will pick up with the remaining part of that second chapter. And soon we're going to be getting into a breakout of what's happening in Azusa Street in Los Angeles. I pray this has stirred your spirit. I pray that this has put faith inside of you. Listen to this over and over and over again. Let's catch the spirit of intercession. Let it not be go past us and let us not be overlooked I just pray that we would humble ourselves before the Lord and that He would do what He wants to do. 
Thank you for listening. I love you. See you in a minute.